Hello everyone, welcome back in. I hope you can hear me. Um, awesome. <laughs> welcome back guys to the um, the ENCODE and Near Horizon Educate series. Um, you can see in the chat that uh, I've uh, dropped our speaker's Twitter information there in case you want to follow. But this is MJ from Proximity and he'll be speaking on um, how to decentralize any front end with BOSS. Um, hey, MJ, how are you doing? Hey, everyone, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Angela? Um, my things aren't connected to my headphones again. Very standard. Um, so apologize if you hear any echo that might be coming from my speakers, but good to see you. Awesome. We can see the screen. Um, Hello. Um, to everyone in the chat, in the audience as well, feel free to drop in a little GM to say hi. Um, maybe um, pop in where you're, where you're joining us from today. Um, and yeah, I will, <laughs> I will stop speaking and hand over to MJ. All right, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session. My name's MJ. And in this session today, we'll be talking about how to decentralize any front end using the blockchain operating system. So uh, before we get started, just a quick intro of myself. So I currently work at, work, work at a company called Proximity Labs. Uh, we are a team that is focused on supporting Web3 projects in the Near and Aurora ecosystems. We provide uh, both monetary support and non-monetary support, such as technical advisory, tokenomics design, uh, community building, and so forth. And prior to that, I spent seven years at Microsoft as a product manager. I helped build a cloud computing service from, uh, from scratch to a non-digit business. And my specialty was kind of in the platform as a service, uh, serverless, Kubernetes, and API space. And during my time at Microsoft, I also had the opportunity to work with over 100 Fortune companies on their uh, cloud strategy, especially around application modernization. And before that, I spent a few years in the traditional finance bands, uh, space uh, and, and helped develop uh, high frequency trading algorithms, risk engines, models, and so forth. So before we get started, just to get a temperature in the room really quickly, um, <clears throat> could you please type in the chat if you are a developer? You can, could you please type one in the chat if you are a developer? Awesome, awesome. And could you please type two in the chat if you consider yourself a Web3 developer? Okay, that's great, that's awesome. Cool, let me reshare my slides. All right, so here is my agenda for today. Uh, so we will first uh, quickly go through the evolution of the web from Web 1.0 to Web 3.0. And we'll also be talking about some of the core ideas of, of Web 3. Uh, then we'll be talking about why decentralization is important and why you should consider uh, decentralizing uh, the front end of your application. And after that, I will introduce you to the blockchain operating system, which I believe is the easiest solution available on the market for building fully decentralized applications. Uh, and then I will give you a quick demo of the blockchain operating system, basically going through like how you can easily prototype and develop a front end using uh, the blockchain operating system. And finally, we will conclude uh, with questions. Um, so yeah, so my goal for today is that hopefully by the end of the session, you will learn a little bit about Web3 if you're currently uh, you know, in Web2. Uh, and you also learn a little bit about the blockchain operating system and understand how it can help you, uh, you know, fully decentralize your application. And the session will be a mix of both conceptual uh, and technical details. All right, so um, over the last three decades, right, we have witnessed the evolution of the web from Web 1.0 to Web 3.0. And Web 1 was kind of the first iteration, right? And you can think of it as a read-only web because in Web 1, users were basically, you know, passively consuming all the information that was, you know, provided to us, right? Think about, you know, websites like Yahoo or, you know, American Online, right? And as users in Web 1, we could not contribute anything for other users, right? So the entire internet was kind of like a giant, you know, Wikipedia, uh, but all hyperlinked uh, together, right? 
And then Web2 emerged around you know, the year of 2004. Uh, and in Web2, users can uh, not just consume information, but also contribute content that other people can consume, right? Think about the videos we post on YouTube or TikTok and the tweets we share on Twitter, right? So basically Web2 uh, became this you know, interactive and a social web. Um, and you can think of it as a read and write web, right? But unfortunately, you know, Web2, as it is today, uh, it's actually very centralized, right? Because a small, uh, you, know, you know, the majority of the internet is, you know, owned and controlled by a small group of uh, companies like, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Amazon, and so forth. And because of that, this leads to problems like, you know, the lack of data ownership, you know, censorship, you know, privacy, and, 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 and so forth. So Web3 is kind of this new evolution of the internet, uh, you know, which leverages you know the blockchain technology and tools for decentralization, and in Web three, users will become you know owners of the content that they produce online, right? And they can also participate in the governance, uh, you know, of you know the projects and protocols that they use. And Web three really tries to you know, empower users to not just you know read and write, but also own uh, you know everything on the on the internet. And here are some of the core ideas of Web3. Uh, number one, Web3 is decentralized, right? Because you know, as ownership gets distributed, users will gain uh, more control and there should be less uh, you know, locking risk. And Web3 is also permissionless, meaning that everyone should be able to participate. Uh, no one should be you know, excluded. And Web3 also has its uh, native payments leveraging uh, cryptocurrencies so it does not have to rely on the kind of the traditional kind of outdated uh, you know, financial infrastructure or payment processors. And because Web3 has you know, its native payment, so it can actually be trustless, right? It can operate on uh, you know, um, you know, uh, incentives and economic you know, mechanisms instead of you know, relying on you know, trusted centralized parties or authorities. However, a very you know, important thing here is that to actually realize these core ideas of Web3, the architecture of Web3 applications are actually built on top of the, you know, the principles of decentralization, right? So now let's first take a look at you know, a high-level architecture of a typical Web2 application today, right? As you can see, this is a very typical you know, client server application. And usually there are three components, right? First of all, you have a database, either it's a, you know, SQL or NoSQL database for persisting the state of your application, right? And then in the middle, we have the backend service, which handles all your business logic and CRUD operations of the database, right? And finally, we have uh, the front end, which provides an interface so that users can interact with the application, right? So this is very typical for, for Web2 application today. And in the era of the cloud, it is very likely or almost certain that you know, these components are hosted you know, with one of the hosting providers or cloud providers, such as AWS, GCP, Microsoft, Azure, and, and so forth. Right? And in comparison, here is you know, an oversimplified architecture of an existing Web3, of a typical Web3 application today. And as you can see, the biggest difference here is decentralization, right? Instead of relying on a centralized database, you can actually leverage um, the blockchain for persisting the states of your application. So in this case, the blockchain can actually serve as a, you know, a state machine, right? And the state machine is distributed across the network of computers or so-called nodes in the blockchain, right? And then uh, your backend service is implemented via something called a smart contract. If you're not familiar with the jar jargon, you can think of a smart contract as a piece of code that is deployed on the blockchain and will be executed by the network of computers in the, in the blockchain network. So as you can see, by leveraging the blockchain, um, we actually you know, you know, instantly you know, decentralize the, 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 the database and the backend service of our application. And there is no single point of failure, right? Because they no longer depend on a single server or a single you know, cloud provider or hosting provider. And the, uh, you know, the smart contract actually runs on a, you know, a, you know, um, 
you know, a network of computers in the uh, blockchain. And finally, we still have our front end, which provides an interface right, for users to interact with your application. So this is you know, the typical architecture of a Web3 application today. And you know, however, if we look at this architecture, do we see any problems? Well, the problem is that if you look at the majority of the Web3 applications out there today, right, their front end, you know, even though they leverage the blockchain for hosting their smart contracts and, and the states you know, of the applications, right, but their front end is usually you know, still hosted with one of the you know, centralized you know, uh, hosting providers, right? So, but why do we need to decentralize our front ends, right? You might ask this question. Well, let, let's think about this, right? Do we think an application is really decentralized if it is centralized at the point of entry, right? And here are some of the concerns of a centralized front end. Number one, our hosting providers are single point of failures, right? Over the last few years, we have seen, you know, you know, a long list of uh, you know outages across all the cloud providers out there. And if you actually, if you go to the Wikipedia page of AWS, you can actually see all the outages that happened to AWS uh, in the last, you know, in, 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 since its inception. And number two, uh, those hosting providers may not share our community ethos, right? So, um, which means that you know, if you are working in a new industry such as Web three, where there is you know ambiguity in regulation there's no guarantee that those hosting providers will continue to serve our content, right? They may take it down you know, at any time for whatever reasons. And number three, uh, you know, a big issue to me is that, you know, under the current paradigm of, you know, front ends, uh, you know, development and, and hosting, users are not aware of any change or update, right, to the front end. In fact, we don't even know the exact version that we are being served, right? Even if the front end code is, you know, is is open sourced. So this means that there's no guarantee that there's nothing, you know, malicious in the front end code that we are that we are using. And last but not the least, for a protocol or a project, if there is only one single front end which is controlled and owned by a single development team, right? This means that the stakeholders of this project or protocols are at the whim of the development team, right? Because the, the dev team can choose to do something that, that may not be in the best interest of the stakeholders, such as you know, users, uh, you know, token holders, investors, and so forth, right? So these are some of the concerns of centralized front ends and why we should consider you know, decentralizing our front ends. And if you are still not convinced, Let's look. Let's take a look at you know some quick examples here. So number one, Amazon actually just had you know a major outage in one of their uh, you know regions in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago, which impacted thousands of their users. And Microsoft actually had a massive uh, outage back in 2018 uh, in their South Central U.S. data center, which uh, unfortunately turned out to be you know probably the most important data center in the US for Microsoft. And unfortunately, I had the, the you know, the, you know, the experience, I had, you know, the, the opportunity to experience the, the whole, you know, crisis uh, while I was at Microsoft back then. And yeah, boy, you know, let me tell you that it's, that's not fun because uh, uh, a lot of the, you know, enterprise you know, mission critical applications were impacted uh, back then. And if you're in Web3, you probably know that the, the website of Arbitrum was actually uh, down during their you know, highly anticipated token airdrop event earlier this year. And during that time, you know, normal users could not claim their Arbitrum tokens, only those you know, advanced users who understood how to interact with, you know, with the smart contract directly could claim the tokens and dump it in, on, on the market, you know, earlier than anyone, right? So this is, um, you know, totally unfair. And uh, another Web3 project called Uniswap, if you're not familiar with them, you can think of them as, a, as an exchange uh, where you can, you know, buy and sell tokens. So Uniswap actually decided to delist over 100 tokens from their user interface uh, back in 2021. Uh, so that users could not uh, trade those tokens uh, through the user interface, and that was a you know a, a solid you know decision by the you know by the centralized dev team. 
And another Web3 project called Curve actually has been uh, hacked. Uh, basically, the hackers pointed the front end to a malicious uh, smart contract, but users were not aware of the, the, the change, right? So they continued to use the application and lost over half a million uh, of dollars because of that. So these are just some quick examples of, you know, of issues in centralized front ends. So if you are considering, you know, decentralizing your front end, right? The next question might be, okay, but how do we decentralize the front ends, right? Well, let me introduce you to the blockchain operating system. So what is the blockchain operating system, right? So at the very high level to end users, the blockchain operating system or BOSS serves as a common layer for browsing and discovering all the open web experiences. So what does that mean, right? Imagine if there is a website where you can go and explore all the Web3 uh, and applications that are available out there and interact with them in one single place, right? That would be a substantial improvement over our existing kind of fragmented uh, experience. And in fact, this is uh, no longer you know, a dream. This is actually a reality. So this is you know, Web3 delivered, uh, not Web3 you no know, promised. So you can actually go to near.org today to play with you know, an early version of the blockchain operating system. You can actually go there and discover you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of applications. And one thing to mention here is that the blockchain operating system is actually compatible with any blockchain. So if you go to near.org, you can find you know, applications that are deployed on Near, but you can also find applications on other uh, you know, uh, blockchains such as Ethereum, you know, Polygon, Arbitrum, BNB, uh, Chain, and so forth. So to developers, the blockchain operating system is a new tech stack for building you know, fully decentralized applications. You know, the key word here is fully decentralized. So the blockchain operating system actually can help you to not just decentralize your backend service, but also the front-end um, service as well, which I will talk a little bit um, in the next few minutes. So here are some of the problems, right, we are trying to um, solve with the blockchain operating system. As, as I mentioned earlier, we already have issues in Web2, such as you know, censorship, the lack of data ownership, and so forth. But unfortunately, in Web3, we, have our, you know, we already have our own issues, right, such as you know, fragmentation, uh, of the uh, of the ecosystems, like you know, each blockchain has its own applications, its own tooling, you know, its own experience, right? So uh, our, we, our ecosystems are quite fragmented. If you are you know on the Ethereum mainnet, you are probably using you know MetaMask, right? But if you want to try something like Solana, you probably need to you know uh, learn something. You know, you, you, you use something like uh, uh, you know the Phantom Wallet. So it's quite fragmented, and this leads to you know another issue. Uh, of you know discoverability, right? If you are exploring a new blockchain, it always you know takes you know time for you to identify you know all these you know marquee you know real you know trustworthy applications in this new ecosystem that are not you know rug pulls, right? And then between Web two and Web three, they share some common issues, such common problems, right? Such as how do you onboard new users to application, right? How do you distribute your product and a service to as many users as possible, right? And infrastructure management is always a challenge, right? As I mentioned, if you're in Web2, you're probably dealing with, you know, Kubernetes clusters, you know, virtual machines and so forth, right? But if you're in Web3, even though you can leverage the blockchain for decentralizing your backend service, right? But you still have the front end to worry about, right? And in, you know, in most cases, you might still be using a centralized hosting provider such as you know, Cloudflare or AWS for hosting your front end, right? So it's never, it's never truly uh, serverless, right? Infrastructure management is always a non-trivial task. So this is why we launched you know, the blockchain operating system. And the goal here is to empower developers by providing them all the tools that they might need for building a fully decentralized application across you know, the entire stack, right? And this is how the, the boss stack looks like. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the very bottom here, we have the blockchain uh, layer, right? Uh, which is you know, where your, you know, your, uh, your asset, your identity, your smart contract, and your trust are lying, right? It is kind of you know, the, the backbone of the stack. And uh, you know, if you are a Web3 developer, we 
would love to have you deploy you know, your smart contract on Near. But as I mentioned earlier, the boss is actually compatible with any blockchain out there. So you can feel free to leverage any, you know, any chain that, that you'd like. Uh, for example, you know, Ethereum uh, and probably you know, hundreds of other you know, chains out there. And then uh, above the blockchain layer, we have the middleware layer, right? So this is a layer of RPCs, indexers, you know, notification services, and also force, right? So the goal here is to provide users and developers the same experience that we are used to in Web2, right? For example, if you are searching for something on, uh, you know, in a search box, you should be able to get a response pretty quickly instead of needing to, you know, traverse the entire blockchain uh, in real time, right? And sometimes this is, you know, this is why, you know, sometimes this layer is also called the data layer or the data platform layer. Essentially, the goal here is to provide fast and easy access to on-chain data to developers and users. And then on top of the middleware layer, we have two layers for building user interfaces. So this is the new thing that we are introducing with the boss. So you can think of it as a new paradigm for developing and deploying your front-end applications. So the way it works is actually very simple. So imagine if you have a front-end, okay? And then you can componentize this front-end into a boss component. This is very similar to how you would componentize something in React or Vue.js. And once you have this boss component, you can actually deploy the source code of this component onto the near blockchain, right? So this is similar to deploying a smart contract on a blockchain. Now you can actually deploy the source code of, um, of a front end on the, onto the blockchain. And by doing that, you actually instantly you know, make this front end decentralized, right? Because you know, it no longer depends on a single server. It actually runs on uh, you know, this, you know, the network of you know, uh, distributed uh, computers in the blockchain network, right? And there's no single point of failure. It is you know, unsensible, you know, always accessible, you know, highly uh, you know, available and resilient, right? And also because the source code of this front end is on chain, right? It is also you know, open source and transparent by default, right? Meaning that anyone can view and audit the source code of this front end at any time, right? And just like how they can you know, view and audit the source code of a smart contract using Etherscan, now they can also view the source code of your front end to enhance security. So once we have this front end component deployed on chain, right? Then we need places where users can discover these components, you know, browse, you know, all these components and interact with them, right? And this is, uh, you know, where the gateway layer comes into play, right? Essentially, you know, gateways provide access points where users can discover and browse and interact with all the on-chain components. And it's extremely easy to run a boss component. Um, you know, so, you know a gate, we, we actually already have you know, a number of gateways available out there. So a gateway can be anything, right? It can be a standalone website like Nier.org. It can be an existing app, like a portfolio app or an information uh, app like, you know, DeFi Llama, right? It can be a browser or it can also be like a wallet, right? And basically these gateways, they fetch the source code of these front-end components from the blockchain and render it, you know, uh, and, and serve it to the users so, so users can interact with them, right? And we already have a, a you know a number of gateways out there, and we are anticipating you know um, much more uh, you know many more that will be coming later this year. And finally, at the very top of the stack, we have the onboarding layer, right? So this is a layer of you know services and products and features uh, that will help developers to onboard new users to their applications. So if you are a developer, right, looking at the stack. Um, you can actually, you, you don't necessarily have to use everything from this stack, right? You can actually choose whatever um, you need, right? For example, if you are a Web2 developer considering, you know, building, a, you know, your first decentralized front end, right? You can just use the UI layers, right? You can just build a boss component, deploy it, um, you know, onto the blockchain and be done with it, right? You don't have to, you know, you know write smart contracts, you know, or use the, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the middleware layer, for example. But if you are a Web3 developer, you know, building a new application, then you might, you know, uh, pick, you know, one or two or, you know, all the 
you know, products or services across the stack, right? So this totally, you know, up to you. It's very flexible. And, uh, um, you know, unlike, you know, uh, the existing, you know, cloud providers, there is no, you know, monthly subscription. There's no contract. Everything is fully permissionless, right? You can, you know, just come and start using the, you know, the, the stack and leave, you know, whenever you, know, you, you would like to. And yeah, it's uh, super easy to, to get started. So here are some of the benefits of using the bus for building decentralized, you know, front ends. Number one is access, like I mentioned earlier, because there's no single point of, you know, um, you know, failure or single point of censorship, right? Because everything runs on the network nodes. Um, it does not depend on a single server or a single provider. Uh, so it should be highly available and very, you know, resilient. And number two, because the source code of your front end is on chain, so it's open source by default, right? So everyone can view and audit the source code uh, of both the front end and, you know, the back end, you know, the, the smart contracts. So it can help enhance security, you know, by detecting, you know, malicious codes or removing, uh, you know, bugs. And I also believe that, you know, the boss is actually the easiest and fastest way to prototype and build Web3 applications today. I will show you how easy it is, you know, you, you know, in a sec. And also, um, once you build a front-end component using the boss, right, it can actually be served and discoverable in, in all the gateways out there, right? So this means that instead of your application just being available at youraplication.com, right, it can actually be discoverable in all the gateways like Neo.org, like all those, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, applications that are going to become, you know, boss gateways. So you can build the ones and you know distribute it everywhere. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is composability. So these boss front-end components, they are individual pieces, right? So they can be used standalone. However, they can also be easily you know, composed and remixed to create new experiences, right? Just like in React, you can create you know, components of components, right? You can do that uh, in, you know, in the boss, and I will show you in my demo. And another thing is that with this on-chain front-end components, right, you can actually create a governance, you know, system for them, right? So, for example, you, you can say that, okay, for every single update to the front-end, it needs to go through a DAO proposal, right? You can govern uh, all the updates and changes. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the BOST is chain agnostic, so it can work with you know, applications that are deployed on any blockchain. Uh, and I'll show how it works in my demo. All right, so I've been talking for about 20 minutes now. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to show you a quick demo of the blockchain operating system. I hope you can see my browser. Okay, so uh, right now we are looking at uh, Neo.org. And as I mentioned earlier, it is one of the gateways available out there for the blockchain operating system today. And the, the job of the gateway is to fetch the source code of the components from the blockchain and serve it to the users, right? As you can see, the whole page here is actually served from the blockchain. And everything you see here is actually a components or a component of components. So besides uh, you know, that, it, it is totally up to the developers or owners of the gateway to decide what other features or, you know, they want to add to, to the gateway or what flavor they want to add to the gateway, right? So as you can see, Neo.org here looks very similar to a, a, a social network, right? You know, indeed, it's actually a social network for Web3 users. Uh, they can actually you know, discover you know, the latest news in the ecosystem. Uh, they can discover you know, the, you know, the new, compo you know, new components that have been developed by, you know, by developers in the ecosystem. They can also see people who have joined recently. They can follow each other, right? You can also create a profile for yourself and post things to your feed, right? So it is very similar to, 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 to a so, so, uh, social network, network here. So it's totally up to the owner and developer of the, of the gateway uh, to decide you know, uh, what kind of gateway they want, they, want, they want to offer, right? And if I go to the Discover tab here, I can actually see you know, thousands of components that have already been you know, deployed uh, by developers, right? To, you know, leveraging uh, the blockchain operating system and if I see something that I'm interested in, for example, if I click on this one, I don't know who built it, I can see some details of this component, right? If I click open here, 
I can actually see how this component looks like, right? This one looks to be a very simple component. Uh, but here, if I go back to the details page, I can instantly see the source code of this front end component, right? I can you know, check if this is something I'm interested in, or I can audit it and see if there's anything malicious in the code if I'm a user who wants to use this application, right? And also if I go to history here, I can, I can actually see all the commits to this front end. I can see all the history here. So this is very similar to, to, to GitHub, right? But it's, you know, everything is, is on chain and, you know, fully transparent. And as a user, if I only, uh, you know, trust a specific version of this front end, right? I can also choose to only use, you know, this uh, specific version. Um, all right. So, uh, let me show you uh, how to create th these components. So first of all, let's take a look at a very simple example. So as you can see, we have a you know, in-browser editor here uh, in the gateway, right? So we can you know, uh, you know, write some code and see how it works, how it looks like you know, at, you know, instantly, super easy, right? Uh, so you are welcome to, to leverage that. Uh, but if you prefer to work locally, we also have a VS Code extension so that you can you know, uh, develop these components in your local machine you know, with you know, a more advanced features uh, inside the VS Code. So here is a very simple you know, Hello World uh, you know, example here. Hopefully you can see the code. So essentially you know, here, uh, this is very similar to JSX, right? I can write JavaScript to define a greeting message. And here is the output of the UI, right? And if I change it uh, to a smaller size, I can do that and click render preview again. As you can see, this has been updated in real time, right? And now if I am done with this, you know, with my code, right? I can just click publish. And this will actually uh, prompt me to sign a transaction to deploy the source code of this front end onto the near blockchain, right? Because we're interacting with the blockchain, so everything is to do to, you know to, to be done, you know, via transactions. And by signing this transaction, I'm also you know, proving to everyone else that uh, you know I am the one uh, who deployed this front end component, right? All right. So now you might be thinking, all right. So this is you know a you know a vanilla you know demo, right? How can we build something more more realistic with the blockchain operating system? So now let's say, okay. So instead of uh, hard coding the greeting message uh, here, right? Let's say. We want to actually have a real backend, you know, via smart contract. Right? Let's say we have a smart contract which has one field for saving the greeting message and two functions, right? One read function to fetch the current uh, greeting message from the smart contract, and one write uh, method or function to override whatever uh, is, you know, saved in the greeting message, right? So here is the the second demo here. As you can see, this is how the UI looks like. So this is the current greeting message, which is saved in the you know in the smart contract on the blockchain, and I can provide a new message and save it, which we'll call the write function, right, to override whatever is there in the contract right now. So if we look at the code, it's actually super simple. So first of all, the first line here is the smart contract on near, right? I've already deployed it on the near blockchain, and then the second line here is basically using the near object to call this smart contract, right? By, you know, calling, we are calling this get greeting, you know, function, which is the read function. And uh, as you can see, you know, with the blockchain operating system, we try to provide all the tools that you might need and expose it to you via like APIs, right? So here, if you want to interact with the near smart contracts, uh, so you can actually just use the near object, which is built in and already kind of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's already provided out of the box. And then uh, we are just updating the state, just like how we can do it, uh, you know, in React. So here are, here are a couple of, you know, helper functions. So the first one is that whenever the input changes, we'll update the states. And whenever the button is clicked, we will use the near object again. This time we are calling the right, uh, you know, uh, function uh, called set greetings here to overwrite whatever is saved in a smart contract, right? with the input from the user. And here we are defining how the forms should be looking, should look like. So the first one is, you know, how the forms should look like when the user has connected their wallet. And the second one here is basically how the form should look like if the user has not 
connect to their wallet, right? Will just show a you know an error or a warning message. And finally, this is the output of the UI, basically using the styled components that we defined earlier. So very simple, right? As you can see, in less than you know fifty five lines of code, we have you know written a front end component that interacts with a real smart contract that is deployed on a near blockchain, right? So this is how easy you can prototype a component, you know, a front end component or an application using the blockchain operating system. So now you might be thinking, okay, so this is a great example, right? But this is still using everything on near, right? Didn't you say that, you know, the blockchain operating system is composable, you know, with any blockchain, right? Can we see an example of it? Okay, so let's, let me show you the, the Lido component here. So if you are not familiar with Lido, basically it is a protocol on the Ethereum mainnet, which allows users to stake their ether um, with the protocol to participate in the Ethereum consensus you know, pro you know, uh, process. And in return, users will you know, earn you know, some you know, uh, rewards as incentives. As you can see right now, the current APR is like 4% uh, with, uh, you know, with Lido. And if you have seen the Lido official website, right? You, 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 you will see that you know, this component we have here looks very similar to the official website of Lido, right? But the, the difference here is that this version here is actually fully decentralized, right? It's hosted on the blockchain operating system served by the network of nodes. So it is unsensible, right? It's, you know, always accessible, right? By anyone from anywhere. Um, and it's, you know, highly available, right? And uh, very, you know, resilient. Um, so users, so in, in addition to using the official front end, users can actually use this front end component to interact with the Lido smart contract, right? So um, if we, you know, look at the source code here, it's actually, you know, extremely simple. We'll just quickly go through it uh, without going into too much details. So the first block of code here is very simple, basically just, you know, checking if the users have connected their wallet, right? And if they are on the correct, you know, uh, blockchain. And as you can see, um, so if you're, not, if you're not familiar with, uh, you know, Ethereum, we already have the uh, ethers.js uh, library, you know, uh, enabled here, so you can use it right away. So it is a library for interacting with the Ethereum blockchain. So here, as you can see that we are using the ethers.js uh, SDK to check if the user has connected and if they are on the right chain. And the second part here is very, is very important. So basically here we are loading the Lido smart contract and the ABI. And if you're not familiar with ABI, you can think of it as the open API specification or swagger for a smart contract. So we are using that to create an interface, uh, which we will use later to interact with this uh, smart contract. So the reason I said it's very important here is because this is where, you know, as users, you can check if this front end is, is actually pointing to the, the official smart contract, right? Instead of something, you know, that could be like a phishing, uh, you know, website. Uh, and as, as we can see that this is the official smart contract and this is the, uh, the ABI that is uh, from the GitHub repository in the repository of the Lido uh, protocol. Uh, and then this part here is basically using fetch to call the Lido API to get the current staking APR, which is pretty simple. Uh, and this part here is basically a helper function to get the user's current staked balance, right? So as you can see, we are using the interface that we created earlier to call this balance of function of the uh, Lido smart contract. And after that, we can you know, do some you know, numbers manipulation uh, pretty easily. Uh, and this function here is basically submitting our ethers, you know, for staking, right? So again, we're using ethers.js to call the Lido smart contract. And as you can see, you can also log to the console here for debugging purposes. Um, and this part here is just detecting the sender uh, or the user or the account um, of the transaction. Uh, and this part here is using ethers.js again to get the user's uh, ethers balance in their wallet. Um, and then we are using, you know, the, uh, you know, fetch again here to call the Uniswap API to get an estimate of the current, you know, gas cost. 
Um, yeah, and here is just uh, fetching CSS for styling. Um, that's pretty much it. Finally, this is the output of the UI, right? So as you can see, within less than you know 330 lines of code, we have replicated the official front end of the Lido protocol, right? So that we have created you know a fully decentralized front end or fully decentralized version of the Lido protocol that you know anyone uh, can leverage. But that's not the end of it, right? So another very powerful thing that users can do is that if I like this component, right, I can actually fork it or you know reuse it to create my own experience, right? So for example, let's say you know because I work in Web three, right? I'm a DJ, right? So uh, you know I so I, I you know I get paid in USDC every month, right? So let's say my scenario here is that every month when I'm paid in USDC, I would like to swap some of my USDC to Ethers, right? And then stake my Ethers with the Lido protocol, right? Because I, you know, I, um, I, you know, I want to support the, you know, the, the network. So right now the process is actually a little bit, you know, tedious or cumbersome because every month when, when I'm get paid, I wanted to first to go to Uniswap, right? To swap my USDC to Ethers, right? And then I need to open a second tab and connect my wallet again, right? And, and you know, go to you know uh, Lido, you know dot fi, and connect my wallet again, and stake my you know ethers, right? So there are like multiple you know tabs I need to open, especially if I want to stake my ethers in multiple protocols, right? I need to connect my you know, wallet multiple times. There are a lot of you know mouse clicks, very cumbersome, very you know tedious, right? So let's say I want to create an experience where I have all the things I need in one place, right? So I need I just need to open one page connect my wallet once and then be able to do all the things that I want, you know, in one place, right? So this is actually extremely easy to do with the blockchain operating system. So in fact, I already have that built uh, in another component here. So as you can see on this page, I actually have a few components. First of all, I have the Uniswap component so that I can swap my tokens. I also have the Sushi Swap component, which was actually a project from a hackathon. So that's another option where I can swap my tokens then I have the ether, I'm sorry, not ethers, but Lido um, components where I can stake my ethers, right? This is the same thing we saw just uh, you know, earlier, right? And finally, I have another component, which isn't you know, the, you know, the best looking component out there, but this one actually is the one inch component that was built by one of the developers at a, you know, at, at a hackathon a couple of months ago, so that I can also swap my tokens with one inch, right? So now I actually have this one single page where I can do all the things that I want in one place, right? And if we look at a source code here, it's actually extremely easy. So we can ignore the first part because this is just you know standard you know boilerplate you know for you know checking if the user has connected their wallet and stuff. And the key part is just here. It's just four lines of code, right? As you can see, I'm using the widget tag here to import a component into this component, right? So Using these four lines of code, I'm actually importing four different components by three different developers into my components, right? So I can have all the things in one place, right? So this is how easy, you know, you can, you know, compose multiple components, you know, in one place, right? And this instantly solves, you know, my pain point, right? I can use it myself. I can share it, you know, with, you know, my friends. But because this is, you know, because you know this component itself is a boss component, right? So anyone can discover it, right? And it can you know uh, fork it and add new features to it. They can even like turn this into a product, right? And maybe you know earn like you know you know referral fees or you know affiliate fees, uh, you know in the future, you know when it's feasible and, and possible. So this is the power of the blockchain operating system, right? It's you know all the things here. That you build is you know transparent, fully discoverable, and you know uh, composable. So there are a lot of you know use cases that I can think of with you know these components. So th which brings me back to you know the final slides of my presentation. So there are many many use cases that I can think of with the blockchain operating system. For example, if you are building a decentralized application, right, you can use the bus to fully decentralize your front ends, like we just saw earlier, right, and you know, in addition to kind of the official front end by the protocol or the project, we can also have like many, many, you know, community run front ends out there, right? Imagine if you have a product uh, and you, you know, 
just released an official front end using the boss, right? And then the community can actually fork it to create their own versions by adding new features, uh, you know, that the you know the official you know dev team does not have bandwidth to add, right? And then for a lot of the you know L1 and L2 ecosystems you know out there, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we have issues of like fragmentation and discoverability, right? So they can actually use the bus to create you know kind of this one-stop shop ecosystem landing page where users can discover all the marquee you know real applications in this ecosystem on the single page and interact with them with minimal friction, right? And in fact, we are already working with a number of ecosystems to help them create uh, this uh, you know, decentralized ecosystem landing page. And if you are already in the Web3 space and have an, you know, a, you know, an existing Web3 application, you can actually install the boss right into your application and make your application in, you know, into a, you know, a boss gateway, right? So that you can actually easily add new features to your existing application uh, by you know, serving those boss components, right? Without writing you know, in a lot of code, for example, you know for De for DeFi Llama, right? If, if I'm you know viewing all the staking APRs on DeFi Llama, actually, actually, so DeFi Llama can actually use uh, you know the Lido components, right? So that users can stake their ethers um, right there within DeFi Llama without needing to switch to another uh, you know website, right? So this will help you know DeFi Llama increase their user engagement, right? And similarly. If you are building a Web2 application and you want to explore maybe you know, adding a Web3 project, or I'm sorry, maybe you know, add one Web3 feature into your, your product, right? You can also leverage the boss to do that so that it takes care of all the you know, heavy lifting. You don't have to you know, do, do everything from scratch. So these are just some of the use cases of uh, the boss. And obviously, uh, boss is due. Uh, in its early stages, right? Because we announced that you know uh, three months ago at East Denver, but we already have a number of partners uh, building on the bus. I know we don't have much time left. I'll just quickly uh, go through the list. So first of all, we have Galaxy, who is running a Space ID campaign leveraging the bus. So basically, on this single page, users are able to uh, complete all the steps um, for for this specific campaign. And this is a uh, uh, so Mintbase is a marketplace where you know users can buy and sell NFTs. Um, so this is the the components that the the, the Mintbase team put together. So uh, users, I'm sorry, uh, developers such as you know game developers, they can actually embed these components uh, in their game, right? So that users, they all their players can buy and sell NFTs right there within the game without needing to, you know to to leave the game. Similarly, this is another component by Mintbase to mass list uh, uh, NFTs for sale. And Keypalm is an onboarding uh, is a, you know is a product in the near ecosystem for easily you know onboarding new users. Uh, so basically, this is a component for uh, anyone to create a link drop uh, so that you can send this link drop to a non crypto user. If they click on the link, uh, you know it will take care of setting up their accounts and they will you know receive. You know some crypto from the user who send their uh, send them this uh, link job. So this component can be embedded anywhere uh, in any third party applications as well. Uh, near task uh, is a platform where your users can earn near by you know completing simple tasks, kind of like you know mechanic Turks, but on the blockchain. They are also leveraging the boss for building their online reputation system. And finally, we have Pike Speak, which is uh, on chain data analytics you know, platform, they actually have a dashboard, I'm sorry, have a component uh, where users can fork and create their own custom you know, uh, on-chain analytics dashboard very easily. All right, so that's, that wraps up my presentation. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, so the, near, uh, the blockchain operating system is already available. Uh, you can actually go to near.org today to check it out. And if you have any feedback, we would love to, to, to hear from you. So with that, I think we can look at some of the uh, questions we have. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we have, I think most questions have been put in the questions tab already. So um, MJ, feel free to go through those in your own pace. Gotcha. Okay. So um, I'll just answer this quick question. Is Boss available on the testnet? Yes, it is available on the testnet. I believe the URL is test.near.org. 
uh, where you can play with it. Uh, how does the workflow changes when you are using version control like GitHub change when you your code can be in regular repository and blockchain? Yes, so you can actually build a pipeline, a CI CD pipeline. So for example, if you source, you have, if you have a source code on GitHub, right, you can actually use like GitHub Action to deploy the source code right to the um, the blockchain. We actually have uh, tooling like a CLI available to uh, to make this uh, uh, easier. And, and yeah, you know, obviously, uh, Boss is in its early stages, so we would love to get you know feedback on DevOps, you know, all the CI/CD, um, you know, operation stuff. Uh, is there any credentials that we do not know to sign up on Boss? Because I'm trying to sign up using with and without wallet, but none of them are working. Also, try it on different browsers too. It's not just me, so. Um. No, there shouldn't be specific credentials. It's no different to like you know signing, you know, creating a new crypto account. Uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me uh, offline. You know, happy to to take a look. I'll point you to the um, to the right uh, contact there. Um, yeah, sorry to hear that. What is the best approach to create a hardware system on near blockchain where an enterprise app can create an individual near wallet? For years, I have tried to use near Um, I don't see the entire question here. Um, but yeah, happy to discuss this offline because this might need um, a longer discussion. Yeah, you, you can find me on Twitter or I can also share my, um, my Telegram uh, handle. It's basically MJ Seattle on Telegram. Uh, even if the source code for compose being fetched from the chain, which is decentralized, the front end, which will use compose still needs to run on some central. Well, so um, yes and no, because uh, if we look at individual gateways, right? Yes, they might still, you know, run on, you know, a centralized, you know, infrastructure and controlled by a centralized team, right? Like near the org, right? However, we have a number of gateways out there and expecting many more to come, right? And this is like a, a distributed network of gateways, right? As users, they don't have to rely on a single gateway for accessing these components. They can choose to use any gateways out there, right? They can also easily run their own gateways locally for, for accessing these on-chain components. So yeah, so even though if you look at a single gateway, it might be, you know, centralized and controlled by a central, you know, a centralized you know entity uh but with the distribution of of gateways uh there's you know users do not need to rely on a single uh, gateway out there how does near uh horizon incentivize auditing boss component that's a good question uh i don't have the answer right now but uh uh yeah happy to uh, to connect offline and see um what are the options available out there <clears throat> oh, pardon me. Sorry. Cool. I think that's um, that's all of the questions, right? Um, yes. And so... also just a, mm. just just a shout out to the near patch team. I think it's a great you know tool for building boss components out there. Uh, yeah, definitely take a look. Uh, I think Zahid uh, shared the link in the chat. Awesome. Um, amazing. Great. Um, and also in regards to Lee's uh, question as well. So I'll, um, MJ, if you would rather prefer to put your own, uh, what's the word, contacts in the chat, you can. Yeah. Um, but I was going to so put your Twitter handle and your, uh, so that one's your Twitter and then Telegram as well. Yes, feel free to put it in yourself. Um Cool. Awesome. So yeah, thank you all so much for coming um, and for engaging as well. I hope that was really insightful. Uh, I definitely learned a lot. Um, what is super exciting is now that you've learned everything there is to know, or at least you've learned a lot about um, building boss components um, and specifically front end components uh, from MJ, you can now enter this competition. Um, so we are running a competition where you can win free Neocon tickets and free bootcamp scholarships. Um, 
And all you have to do is submit uh, your boss component that you've built. So I've just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, I've also been emailing this round if you have signed up to the kind of bootcamp mailing list. Um, but if you have any questions, ping me as well. Um, hopefully you know where to find me. Um, the deadline, I don't think there's a hard deadline yet. We've got a few weeks because I think it will still be open um, for the near boot camp. Um, so during the near boot camp as well. So um, I think you've got a while. So please do enter the competition. Um, and yeah, get involved. I don't think that there is a limit to how many components you could you can submit um either so please go wild guys um awesome any last words mj i just want to say that please uh, if you're interested in building on the bus feel free to check out our, uh, on our bounties at east global events as well as nearcom That sounds very awesome. Yeah, please do. Um, and to finally answer Eduardo's question, yes, the video today will be up on our YouTube channel. It will be in the playlist um, for uh, the whole series, for the whole Near Horizon Educate series. So um, please, I think you can just check out Encode Club on YouTube and you'll find it. Um, other than that, uh, Zahid is asking, can you share the link for the bounty at ETH Global? Yeah, I don't have it handy right now. I'm sure that uh, uh, we are uh, providing bounties at the East Globe event in Istanbul, in New York, uh, in Paris. Cool. Um, yeah, and we also have two near events, near Khan later this year in, in November and near APAC, which is in Vietnam uh, in September. So yeah, so these are the five events and I'm certain that there will be a, in a bunch of uh, bus bounties available. Definitely you know, check them out um yeah cool sounds awesome um thank you so much guys for coming um i think we'll wrap it up there uh, and thank you mj for speaking today and everyone in the chat for engaging cool so we'll see you tomorrow um for the next educate uh series and the last one as well um starting at 5 30 p.m uk time um and yeah, let's uh, <laughs> end this series on a high note. Thanks so much, MJ. See ya. Thank you. Cheers.